All right, so good morning, Monday morning. Um, I know you guys like it as much as I do, so thanks for giving me a Monday. But here we are, IT review for the hematology related keywords. And this is the list of keywords uh, which commonly pop up on your ITE. Uh, we're going to go through that, but also keep in mind, you had a whole month of blood bank rotation where you went through that topic. So just dig deep as further away this is. But at most of that stuff you should have heard. Okay, people who work with me now, I write those formulas down to the grind with you. Um, so when it comes to anything like about uh, hematology, in especially like you know, uh, oxygen transport related uh, questions, keep in mind DO2 needs to meet VO2. Okay. How do we calculate DO2 oxygen delivery? It depends on your uh, ox uh, geocardic output and your arterial oxygen content. Okay, VO2, thick equation, you look at also your cardiac output, but the extraction between arterial and venous oxygen content. That's your global assessment. VO2, you can ballpark it 250 cc's per minute or 4 cc's per kilo per minute. Pediatric patients more awake more than asleep. Okay, just to give you a ballpark. That's your VO2. But actually what you're looking at is the extraction between arterial and venous. Means SVO2, yada, yada, yada. Okay. So oxygen delivery depends on cardiac output and arterial oxygen content. So let's look at anemia. How do we compensate for acute anemia, acute loss of oxygen carriers? If I know DO2, which needs to be maintained, depends on cardiac output and arterial oxygen content, if this goes down, the other one has to go up. If I know cardiac output depends on stroke volume and heart rate, volume over rate, unless you can't increase volume because you're hypovolemic or you have any kind of reasons where you can't increase your volume, restricted cardiomyopathy, neonates, elderly, they just don't have the extension function to open up to give you 80 cc's of stroke volume, but need to stay rigid at their 50, they're going to increase your heart rate. So what are the physiological responses to acute anemia, acute loss of oxygen care and function? Your blood flow is going to change. If I lose volume, but also oxygen carrier, your cardiac output is gonna compensate for that, as we just discussed, and your driving force there is the sympathetic stimulation, no epinephrine, your adrenal gland is gonna know like, mm, something ain't right, and it's gonna do something about it. Your venous tone, Remember, the majority of your blood volume, 85 to you know, 80% is in your venous circulation. Your venous tone is going to compensate for the lack of oxygen carrier. So you have venoconstriction. Your circulation becomes centralized. Prioritize the vital organs, brain, lung, and heart. It's all more epi driven. Okay. And so therefore, that's how we globally compensate for that, and then there are also regional abnormalities because surely your organs, not only what you're seeing global, also is going through this regionally. The kidney is a perfect example. You have cortex blood flow, you have medulla blood flow. Cortex relatively needs more oxygen, however, gets less blood support. Okay, so you get more medulla blood flow. It explains the ATN you sometimes see after situations like that. So what does anesthesia do to this physiologic compensation of blood loss? Most of our drugs do vasodilation, interferes with your norepi regulation of, or you know, intent to compensate uh, by centralization. So the, the vasodilation of majority of our uh, anesthesia medication, the negative inotropy, especially some of our induction medications carry, completely <coughs> interfere with that. And then the lack of sympathetic tonus, because you know. Some of you guys have seen a trauma patient go off to sleep. As soon as you push even fentanyl, who is the ben most benign hemodynamic agent we have, just the lack of sympathetic tone just makes them uh, you know, significantly decompensate. Also, one important acute compensation, the oxygen dissociation curve. So let's look at that. Okay. The right shift of your oxygen dissociation curve, which describes your affinity of hemoglobin to oxygen, right, raise in 2, 3 dpg, acidosis, H plus, and temperature shifts the affinity of the hemoglobin to oxygen to the right, which means the hemoglobin is more likely to release oxygen in the peripheral tissue. So that's something you actually want. That is a buffer 
in shock we have because the three oxygen carrier have at least like, are willing to throw the oxygen to the tissue versus if you shift to the left, meaning alkalosis, hyperventilation, etc., the hemoglobin has a more affinity to hold on to the oxygen. Same amount of oxygen carrier, but more likely to give or take. So that's something when you have some acidotic and you compensate or you, you shift them back to normal, I always like think about, is this a good thing right now I'm doing to my microcirculation? In offspin, acute anemia, what, does, you know, what people do when they're chronically anemic, an example would be end-stage renal disease. Okay, they're chronically anemic because they don't have aetoportin to make oxygen carriers. Most of the time, they are normovolemic. The oxygen traction ratio is optimized by the increase in 2,3 DPG. 2,3 DPG is a glue between hemoglobin and oxygen. So as more as you have of that, as more the hemoglobin is going to say, like, oh, okay, we can pack one in the middle. All right, put one on there. Um, so uh, you can put 10 people in a uh, Fiat Miata, okay? You know, take that with you. That's kind of like how this looks like. Let's hope it's possible, okay? So, um, so that's the major compensation mechanism in chronic anemia. That's why those people don't look anemic because they've optim optimized the carriers they have. Therefore, shifting the oxygen dissociation curve towards the right, that's the majority of mechanism they are using. <sighs> okay, so much about reviewing oxygen transport and what you guys need to know for compensation, acute or chronic. So let's get into like, mm, well, somebody is anemic and I'm deciding to do something about it. Let's talk about transfusion reaction and then actually when it gets to the action part. So I picked a few of those where there's the majority of uh, <coughs> um, keywords organized. So let's go to the first one, the febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. Um, it's the most benign one. That's why we, eh, you know, on in-service, uh, ward patient, especially like in Markey, um, uh, if you would work more there, you would see this much more commonly. In anesthesia, we rarely pay attention to it. We are happy when the temperature comes up. So, um, so, but it's the most common one. And basically what happens, it's like a mild response to an HLA incompatibility, which is carried by your white blood cell contamination of your packed red blood cell. Kinetics, you know, it starts yeah, a little bit after the transfusion dribbles in, but that is, you know, the speed how things work on the floor, and you get about a one to two hours. It's a benign reaction, but at the point when you get called, when you notice it, you don't know that. There are many things which can cause fever, so you need to rule out sepsis or something more uh, severe, uh, which would be then more an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. So you stop the transfusion, rule out, make sure nothing else is going on. And then when you prophylax with Benadryl, you know, acetaminophen, you know, it usually is okay for the next time we give. Mepiridine has been used, so. But the key part here is you can reduce the severity of the incidence if you use leukocyte reduction. Leukocyte reduction, standard process here at UK, but in other hospitals it's not. It means that with an extra filtration step after donation or after the product is done, before it gets, uh, uh, gets stored, you reduce the white blood cell concentration from really high to less than five millions. So you can only imagine how much higher it was, you know, how much you filter out. But by decreasing the amount of HLA carrying particles, which are white blood cells, you decrease the severity of that. So leuco reduction actually is used in a lot of transfusion reaction with, with severity of you know, what's more beneficial and what's not, because it's an expensive step, but here for febrile non-hemolytic, definitely uh, the money-winning step. Um, for immune regulation, auto atomization, eh, because one white blood cell can already cause a lot of damage. Definitely CMV transmission, because CMV, cytomegalovirus, is carried in a nuclei, where blood cells don't have nucleus. Okay, so that's a transfusion reaction. As more white blood cells you give, as more chances of contamination and then um, uh, infecting your, your donor you have. Okay, so just keep in mind there are more, okay, but remember the steps so when you know what's going on, you can probably figure out when it's valuable and when it's not. 
Okay, another complication we rarely see, but I love to ask questions about that, is the IgA deficiency um, and uh, reactions towards it. It's very common, but most people are asymptomatic, so we don't know. Keep in mind, Northern European heritage, Caucasian, have it most commonly. So in your stem would be somebody like that. And what happens is because I'm AGA deficient, I've never seen this before. So now I'm getting a blood transfusion. Now I have seen it. Now I make antibodies. If I see it again, I'm going to have an anaphylaxis. High chance of having an anaphylaxis. Okay. So what's the cure of that? Never show me IgA if you know. Your diagnosis, oh, now I have antibodies against I, uh, uh, immunoglobin A. So I said, like, the treatment or approach would be never, ever show me that. But if you know I have done it, don't give it to me again. It's a re, the second step where I'm going to have a response. You can decrease but not eliminate if you used wash, wash red blood cells, which means the transfusion product gets an extra step of washing, car wash, to decrease the amount of contamination, meaning showing me different proteins during the transfusion. Okay, so that's a washing step. Okay, another money winning uh, keyword on your IT, trolley. What is trolley? Transfusion related acute lung injury. ARDS in combination with blood component therapy. So think about ARDS when you think about trolley. It is a significant factor in transfusion related mortality. Currently we say leading, but you know, that's always a little bit of a reporting step in how popular this diagnosis is right now. It's immune mediated, and it's immune mediated also through HLA. We don't have any data if glucose reduction is helpful, but just thinking through it, it should be. Okay. We don't really know the specific, what really causes uh, a trolley yet. Still working on it, but ADS like shows up one to six hours after transfusion, not immediately. And then you get a non gravity or non cardiogenic pulmonary edema on both sides, severe hypoxemia and you have no other factors to explain that. No aspiration sepsis, and, and that's kind of where like it's a reporting issue. You really have to be, you know, you, you cannot be 100% certain or not certain it's going on. Actually, some, most of the times you make the diagnosis, but it just goes away after three, uh, three days like that. Then you think about, like, hmm, must have been trauma. Okay, so what's the pathophysiology? So we know there are antibodies against white blood cells involved. So it's HLA triggered, not uh, RBC, HLA. But we don't know who's bringing the antibody and who's bringing the antigen. But we know it happens because when you think about it, you give venous blood, like if on a venous sign form blood, where's the first filtration step? This blood is gonna go through the first contact you go with capillary circulation in your lungs. Lung is very immunogenic, very immune active. That's how we learn our environment, so breathing, right? So there's a lot of immune cells present in your lung. And so somebody's gonna say like, this doesn't belong here. And it's gonna cause uh, immunogenic response, which then breaks down your capillary membrane. Neutrophils, macrophages, all of them involved. Female donors have a higher likelihood of causing that because just to birth, you have seen more foreign proteins in your circulation, so therefore you have more HLA antibodies already present. Right now the current model is believed to be a second hit. Something already pissed off your immune system in the lungs. Something already made this weaker. So then a little smaller aggravator comes in there and then causes the big reaction. Summary, arts, non-cardiogenic, non-dependent, pulmonary edema, both sides. Now, time frame is plus minus six hours after transfusion. And what you do, really not much, supportive. You do what you do for ARDS. You get in full because it will get better. All right, next topic, massive transfusion. Definition, more than 10 units. 
or loss of, if you have a baby that's kind of like hard to achieve, or loss of one blood volume, or more than one unit in less than five minutes. So if you have to use level one in Belmont and all those fancy things, probably we can call it massive transfusion. The complications here summarized, hypothermia, all of this is cold and you never have enough time to warm it up to blood temperature. You give a lot of citrate, so they have cytotoxicity, coagulopathy related if you only give red blood cells and you're bleeding whole blood, you might cause a deficit here. Uh, acid-base abnormalities, pH, we talked about the acidosis, okay, and all your components are on the acidotic side, uh, but also potassium, magnesium. Okay, potassium, we always worry about the hyperkalemia, actually hypokalemia is more common. And uh, yeah, so this, these are the electrolytes here. Okay, so in detail, um, citrate intoxication uh, comes across as a hypocalcemia because that's how citrate works. It binds your calcium, which is an important part of your coagulation cascade, so therefore, no making clot. Red blood cells, FFPs are part of your massive transfusion approach. FFP has three times the citrate load of PRVC, so keep that in mind. Uh, FFPs actually are much more harmful here than your PRVCs, but both of them can, can hurt you. The people at risk, because citrate is metabolized in the liver, so people at risk are either compromised liver function before or you have a shock liver. Lactate can give it away to you. Um, or neonates who just don't have the liver capacity to metabolize all that citrate. Hypothermia, I uh, already talked about that, just the temperature you transfuse in the time you have to warm it up. We talked about the acid-base abnormalities. And, uh, <coughs> um, uh, you know, functional liver can metabolize the citrate into bicarb, so therefore you have an automatic buffer for your um, acidosis. Okay, massive transfusion is not only a problem of oxygen carriers, it's also a problem of, of coagulation. So you see a lot of coagulopathy related to massive transfusion. Due to either those three factors, and the unfair question sometimes is, what's most important? They all are, and I think they have stopped asking the direction. But if you ask, gotta think about where you start out. Fibrinogen, we usually start around 200, so cutting in half, you know, you consider coagulopathic. Thrombocytopenia, if I start out with 300,000 of platelets, I have a little bit more buffer. So that's just a math game, what's more important, but both those two probably are the ones which are to blame when you see coagulopathy in a trauma patient. Your factor deficiency, thinking we're starting out with 100%, actually is the least likely factor. But it's not only delusional, it's also consumptive. So here I have this little slide here to summarize the coagulation problems you encounter in a trauma patient or in a massive hemorrhagic, uh, a hemorrhage patient. So you have a delusional coagulopathy, but you also have a consumptive coagulopathy. Delusional, delusional, due to the amount of crystalloid resuscitation you have been given. That's why right now we're jumping towards MTP right away in this 111 configuration or 11 and perhaps another one meaning FFPs and uh, PRVC ratio. Um, so you try to keep the crystalloid down, but you go with blood products in a certain ratio, not only PRC. The consumptive coagulopathy is related to your acidosis, to your tissue injury, to your lactate. As more your tissue is hurt, as more have they activated the internal compensation, meaning coagulation uh, uh, pathways, so therefore more acidosis, more here, and therefore they haven't already consumed their coagulation path, and they've become coagulopathic. Hypothermia surely doesn't help. Every coagulation process is enzyme-driven, so when you're cold, you don't clot well. Acidosis, also here, uh, the tissue dilation you see with acidosis makes it hard to form a homoclop, and the liver dysfunction related to shock, all those are components making a trauma patient more coagulopathic because of both reasons. So what we do when someone is bleeding out? Okay, it's now hemostatic resuscitation. To drive home the point, it's not just only restoring volume, it's restoring a functional volume. 
So step number one is like control the bleeding. You know, unless you get this under control, you just never make ground. You're treading sand. You limit your crystalloid, but you emphasize your resuscitation with blood components. You try to keep your blood pressure on the low side because less blood pressure, less bleeding, right? Okay, but take this like with a very cautious step because there might be reasons other organs would like to have a little bit more perfusion pressure, especially the brain. So if you have a TBI, a TBI then you uh, not necessarily want to go that hypotensive, but you do the best you can. And the ratios right now is PRBC and FFP one to one. That's how your cooler comes up. The ratios for platelets and for cryos are not known. Played around, but not known. You throw it in the SUC coagulation problems. That's why monitoring becomes important. We get to that step later on. Um, cryo participants, if your fibrinogen less than 100, and you try to maintain temperature to support the coagulation process. When do you give type O versus negative? So a patient comes in, I don't know anything about them, so I give that blood component which has the least chance of uh, reaction. So the O blood type is the universal donor, that's what you go with. But now rhesus positive versus rhesus negative. This antigen, the D antigen, rhesus has like several components, but the D is the one we're usually going for because it's the most antigenic. A very small contact with blood type of rhesus positive will make you convert. So therefore, anybody that we think of, right, they're going to see that blood type again, we don't want them to make antibodies. Female in the productive childbearing range should be the ones, or well, less than childbearing range, you know, children, should be the ones who get all rhesus negative. Anybody else, you can kind of like go with positive, meaning male, in women above childbearing range range. However you define that, that becomes more and more fluid. But I want to say probably menopause, 55 and above, you probably can say like we can give reasons uh, positive here. Okay, what do we need to know when we try to avoid giving uh, blood components uh, uh, from other people? Salt saver. We don't use it in the operating room that much anymore, but it's set up by the nurses, but that's something we need to know about. This is like the circle which is set up. You have a suction catheter on the field where you capture everything bleeding from the field. It goes in a big container that's collected. When I have enough to be collected, it gets washed, spent, separate what you don't want from the what stuff you want, and then you return to the field. So these are the steps. You can't give cell saver unless you capture blood from the field. Okay. Then it has to be sufficient. If I only have 200 cc's, that container will not fill, so you have nothing to wash. And then the product I give back has a hematocrit of 50 to 60 percent or higher. It's very concentrated. So you also have a pretty good volume effect when you give it back. But just keep in mind, it's only red blood cells. No coagulation cells, no coagulation factors. So um, the obvious uh, concern, which is not mentioned here, is you are actually making a coagulopathy worse because you're transfusing red blood cell carriers without any accompanying blood products or, or like co coagulation fact, uh, factors. So you have to keep that in mind when you use it, you might want to compensate for that. The error steps uh, in the ITE that go for are the, you know, when, when cell saver actually can hurt you. So when you capture from the field something which is contaminated and you can't wash it off, then you put your patient at risk. Cancer cells, GI contents, E. coli, et cetera, can be a risk. So that's why you don't like to use contaminated blood. Ortho, when they do a hip, and you have glue, you know, that, that cement they put in there, probably that's not the time you want to use a cell saver because you cannot ensure that this patient is going to get safe product retransfused. There are filter steps you can put in there to make it safe, but for ITE, let's just keep it there. Okay. So insufficient washing, insufficient anticoagulation, there are clots in there, or 
you don't wash it off enough, there's heparin in there, can put your patient at risk. Um, the other thing is when the cell saver is not set up right, because that bell creates a lot of suction, so if that tubing is directly connected to the patient, you can cause air embolism or actually also uh, the con uh, you know drawing up blood. So it usually goes from the patient to the bag, from the bag to you. Okay, so there's always an extra step in there. The machine di directly is not connected to the patient. Okay, so um, this is a patient group which also is getting more and more emphasized in our peer operative approach. So. Um, want to review our approach to a uh, Jehovah's Witness patient. When you see them in the pre-op clinic, and they are uh, at, you know, posted for a blood loss case, you have steps to intervene. You can optimize the hematocrit. Uh, the autologous blood donation is not a step for them because based on their religious faith, blood becomes impure when it leaves your circulation. So if I give it up in front and it's stored for two minutes, uh, for two, uh, or three weeks, not in my circulation, not a step that would accept. Okay. But I can give them air to potent and I can give them iron. So if they're already showing up anemic, that's something preoperatively you can do. There are side effects to everything. The iron is GI wise, not necessarily well comp uh, uh, um, tolerated and also not very high efficient. So you need a couple of weeks to do that. Uh, but iron supplementation is an important step in that. Erythroposin also works for them, however, has side effects. DVT risk increases. You increase the viscosity by more oxygen carriers. Um, so it's not a step you would give to everybody, but you can give it to your risk witness. Interoperatively, you decrease the blood loss. That's surgical technique. Okay, that's normothermia. Uh, that's reduce your crystalloids. Now, these are the interoperative steps you can do. Um, Antipapalytics, coagulation, also that is accepted, especially like in ortho. Um, that's where you run your TXA or your, your uh, antipapalytics pretty routinely. Um, when it comes to products, that's something you need to clarify with them up in front. Most of them will uh, accept albumin. We talked about the cell saver. As long as you emphasize the blood always stays in contact with you in your circulation, they may accept that as well. It's a little bit interpretation how much they uh, um, uh, interpret their religious uh, limitations, but it's a step you can discuss when you worry about it. And if you emphasize it stays with you, then it's usually something they might be agreeable to. Postoperative, blood work. Minimize how much blood work you do afterwards. Sometimes if you can't do anything about it, why do I need no hematocrit? Okay, so you minimize your adrenaline losses. Um, consider your oxygen consumption. Waking up is hard to do, okay? Waking up increases your oxygen demands by factor six or so. So when you have a low hematocrit, perhaps you can plan for delayed emergence. That's all you have to do. Normothermia, same thing, okay? Wa warming up is hard to do. You don't want to do that to a patient who has a limited oxygen carrying capacity. Analgesia, oxygen consumption. So keep that in mind postoperatively. That's what you can do. If you can't change your oxygen content, you have to change your VO2. VO2 you can change, change your VO2. And when I say proactive antibiotic approach, that's also mentioned, um, because you don't want infection. Infection increases your oxygen consumption. You keep the antibiotics on a little bit longer. Okay, anticoagulation, or coagulation. Just emphasizing this here, you all have seen it plenty of time. Something you probably want to internalize before you go to the ITE. But let's talk about uh, the keywords are more oriented towards coagulopathy. So these are the high yield areas we're going to review. Let's start off with the easy one, hemophilia, A and B. Okay, it's an X-linked deficiency. And so therefore you have a little bit more male than female presentation. Factor eight causes hemophilia A. Factor nine causes the hemophilia B. So that's the big thing to keep apart because the treatment steps depend on like what's your problem, what's your factor deficiency. Uh, a lot of people are asymptomatic when they only have a mild factor reduction. So it's like, you know, it takes about less than 30% before you really see something. So if they're in the mild category, you're not. They only present when a little bit of blood loss makes this worse. 
treatment approach for hemophilia A, desmopressin, because desmopressin squeezes out factor VIII and factor Willebrand, actually, from the endothelium. Okay. So that's your step in hemophilia A. You start with desmopressin because you may just be able to shift enough factor VIII out. Then there are concentrates. Recombinant concentrate makes it very safe. And if everything fails or you're massively underwater, that's the first FDA appro uh, approval for Novo 7 or activated factor 7 was hemophilia bleeding. For hemophilia B, because you know that's the, the factor 8 doesn't matter, so here you just skip the desmopressin step. You go to concentrate or to Novo 7 right away. The approach is not unique for every hemophilia patient. It depends on your surgical stimulation. So that's what this graph is in there, depending on what hemophilia category you have, what fact activity you have, what surgery you do, your approach will be different. To make the you know, long answer short, hematology consult. Okay, in your ITE, what do you do preoperatively? You want to have a specialist tell you what you need to do. You don't have to learn that table. Van Willebrand's disease. Here the problem is we don't have enough Van Willebrand factor, which is a mediator between endothelium and platelet. This, in opposite to hemophilia, is autosomal. So no difference between male and female. But same presentation. Your prothrombin time is normal. Your platelet count is normal. Your partial thromboplastin time is abnormal. That's the one which triggers your workup. More categories to Van Willebrand. One, two, and three. One is the benign one, which means we have just not enough. Two, we have a defective one, but it's somewhat working between A, B, and C. And then three is like we have no. Okay, so that's the severe one. Therapy also, here we start with desmopressin. It squeezes out factor eight and Van Willebrand factor. If that doesn't work, you go with concentrate. If that doesn't work, you can go with cryo or with platelets because all of them carry some form of Van Willebrand factor, not FFP. Also here, something to summarize our approach. So keep in mind, type one is the most common one, 70 to 80%. And these are the ones which just don't have enough. So these are the ones which usually respond to desmopressin. Category two, different forms of category two, have a defective Van Willebrand factor. So here, they still may respond to desmopressin, hmm, but depends a little bit on what the quantity and what the defect is. And then type three, desmopressin, it's not going to work because you don't have Van Willebrand factor, so you have to go to your alternative steps, meaning cryo and platelet transfusion relatively early. All right, when do I give FFP, since I already mentioned it? FFP has pretty much all the coagulation factors in very concentration. So the big thing is to reverse Coumadin, or vitamin K, antagonist warfarin, blood loss situation. You don't really want to use it to compensate for a single abnormality unless you really have to, meaning you don't have um, a factor concentrate available. Um, keep in mind, like HIV, when it first came out, the reason why a lot of hemophiliacs got infected was because the use of blood product, especially this one, because it's contaminated. So it doesn't make sense for one single abnormality uh, to give that broad of shotgun towards your abnormality. Heparin resistance. That makes sense, right, to give FFP for heparin resistance, unless you remember antithrombin-3 which is the mediator for your heparin to work, is an FFP. So when you want to go and pump, your AT, uh, ACT does not come up with your loading dose of heparin. You think about heparin resistance due to endothrombin deficiency. So you give FFP and whoop, you're coagulopathic. When do I not give uh, FFP? Yes, you don't give it for volume. Yes, it's a high protein load but you never want to correct your volume with a blood product, right? That's frowned upon, you know, keep Dr. Burrell in mind, don't do that. Okay, this is not a clinical exam, right? It's IT. But what makes sense, INR of 1.7, you correct with FFP. So 
just like well the ion of ffp is 1.7 okay it's it's a coagulation product which shouldn't be clotting right so you use a lot of citrate to keep it uh, intransfusable so therefore it's not a normal uh, configuration doesn't have a normal INR. So if you have a low yield, uh, meaning an INR of 1.7, correcting this with FFP is hard to do. Not impossible, neurosurgery still demands it in the guideline, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, if a patient is not coagulopathic, you don't need to give FFP. When you have a better product available, you don't give FFP. And if you can correct your vitamin K deficiency or artificial deficiency um, in time frame, meaning if I give vitamin K IV, I can reverse it in six to eight hours. If I give it PO, I can uh, correct it in one or two days. You also don't have to go with FFP. Reason why you don't want to give that much FFP is because you give 10 to 15 cc's per kilo, that's a lot of volume. So there is an alternative step to working. Cryo participate, you give, when you have something better to give, what is not necessarily represented in, uh, in uh, FFP. So Van Bullerman factor okay. and fibrinogen are the one clinically important. Uh, there is fibrinogen in FFP, it's a plasma product, but it's in a normal concentration, 180 milligram per cc. FFP has six times that much. Okay. So you, know, you, you can correct hypofrenogemia with uh, FFP, it's not like that you get lower, but here you have a much smaller volume and you give more. Um, should be ABA compatible, and cryo is a considered step in hemophilia A and Van Bullerman disease because it contains a Van Bullerman factor as well. Summarize that because it also might be a big point in your exam, when to give uh, FFP, when to give cryo. Think about fibrinogen. There is some in FFP, but there's more in cryo. Think about the special things. Van Willebrand, factor eight, that's in cryo, that's not in FFP, not enough. The ABO compatibility, FFP has to be compatible, cryo somewhat. And the cost, cryo is much more expensive than FFP. Opposite coagulation abnormality, factor Leiden, factor F Leiden deficiency, that's a hypercoagulation problem. You're making blood clots. DVTs a lot, venous circulation, um, and you treat that with anticoagulation. Factor seven, um, it is a super physiological dose of factor seven you give when it comes to coagulation abnormalities or how to treat um, a bleeding patient. The only thing you need is tissue factor. You need a platelet who gets activated and you need factor seven, you can activate it, and you need fibrinogen to make a clot. These are the three components. So when I have a tissue factor, meaning there is a, dish, a tissue defect, when I have platelets to be activated, I only need factor seven to say cough like, let's do it, and you give fibrinogen and there's a clot. Okay. So the biggest complication with, uh, uh, with factor seven is you get clots where you don't want to. You might fix the bleeding, but you overshoot the target because surely it's a global agent, not a specific one. Indications the FDA had been very restrictive when we should be using, hemophilia was the first one to come out, but as you probably have clinical known, whenever we don't know what to do, we use Novo7. I will send you out an email about a great review paper recently coming out, AA, who talked about the high yield topics. If you have time, put it underneath your pillow. The diffusion gradient sometimes helps with the learning, or just look at it. Anything you want to know about that topic, including this one, is really very nicely expressed in that paper. Um, another thing which I think, it was not a keyword yet, but it will show up in ITE at the uh, prothrombin complex. It's an alternative to FFP, much smaller volume than FFP. More expensive, but I can reverse someone in 15 minutes where it would take me much longer with FFP to give you the 10 to 15 cc's per kilo. Um, there are three different categories, factor three, factor four, and fever. Okay. It, you know, if you think about the vitamin K dependent factors, 1972, for whatever reason, just sticks in my mind. I have 10, nine, seven, and two. That's what the vitamin K dependent factors are. So that's contained in here. 
was developed primarily for coumadin, but factor three has everything but seven. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the factor three products have everything but factor seven. The, fa the, the four factor components have all those four, and fever has all those four, but factor seven is activated because of the A, you can remember, is the activated factor seven. So these are the products out. Here's the graph out of the paper, but if you want to have more information about it, especially what the names of those are, you can surely go through the paper. And, oh, no, this one, oh, here we go. Okay, sorry. Okay, anticoagulation therapy, just those are the things you need to learn. You need to know what mechanisms you are, your products go through. Okay, I'm not gonna review this here, but this is the um, thing I, I, I want for you to internalize. What does every anticoagulant do to your parameters, meaning PT, PTT? What other options you have? There's you know, uh, uh, activated 10 activity for happen monitoring is something relatively new. I don't think it's gonna come up on your ITE, but it will at some point. And then the reversal steps as far as what we know about so on. You see how often those PCCs are now recommended. Um, for the new agents, Paduxas, Alretto, and Eliquis, um, PCCs are in the making. Paduxas is the only one where we have right now an accepted uh, antibody against it. The other ones are in the making, but they're not. I think they're still experimental, so not something you can has, get tested on. But this is a, a, a table you just need to go through step by step because I think the majority of issues can be addressed here. Plated dysfunction with end-stage renal disease, uremia, interferes with how the platelets work, meaning they're lazy and they don't want to attach to anything, they don't want to get activated. So you have normal platelet count, but not normal platelet function, and that depends with your level of uremia. Additional to the chronic acidosis, vasodilation, so it makes it harder for really a clot to be formed because you don't have the motility of the blood vessel to contract and to stop the bleeding as well. Other pharmacological um, uh, abnormality, the HESPAN, we don't use it anymore, but you still get occasionally tested on it. Test, uh, HESPAN is a starch, so it's a sugar. It glues your platelets. It makes them less approachable. So that's one way how to think about the coagulopathy related to HESPAN. Um, but also, it is a dilution of coagulopathy. You have fibrinogen, you have factor uh, two, seven, uh, two, eight, uh, 13 and 10 activities are also decreased with HESPAN. There's a daily limit, uh, 20 cc's per kilo, you shouldn't give more. Coagulation monitoring, TAG. Okay, so you look at certain parameters, the R value, which represents your factor availability. You look at your K value, which is the time, how quickly a, uh, a clot happens. The alpha angle says the same thing, it's just on the square, it's the alpha angle, um, how quickly the, the clot happens. Your maximum al uh, amplitude uh, tells you how mechanical durable the clot is. That's your platelet number. This here, like the, the, the K value, is more the interaction between your coagulation product, but this definitely is your, pla uh, your platelet count. And then your maximum amplitude at uh, 30 minutes means how mechanical durable your clot is, aka fibrinolysis. So here are some examples, what's normal, what's abnormal in TAG, and how you interpret that. So the normal one, ensure that this is uh, hypercoagulability, but here you see the prolonged R value, so not enough factors, the steepness, not enough interaction, and then most importantly, it's shrinking the uh, the, the, the fish tail here at the end, that's fibrinolysis. Compared to this one, we're also here, not enough factors, not enough interaction, not enough platelets, but then it doesn't change over time. So this patient is just truly coagulopathic, but there's no sign for consumption. Last, not least, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm speeding here, uh, porphyria, that's uh, abnormality in the heme metabolism, um, enzymatic uh, activity, and what we worry about is the acute intermittent porphyria attack, which is triggered by your cytochrome P450 uh, induction. Patients look like they get abdominal pain, they have no uh, CNS abnormalities, no logical and psychiatric. So for us in anesthesia management, well, pretty much all our drugs activate P450, okay? So pick one. Okay. What's currently known, what's safe, 
Okay. A benzos, ketamine, opiates, succina choline, they're safe. Nitrous oxide, isofluorine, we don't know enough about SIBO and this. Uh, it's not that common um, that patients present with this, um, but that's what's considered safe. Regional anesthesia is safe. Just don't use lidocaine because that's not safe. Okay. Contraindicated are barbiturates, especially theopentol, anatomidate, and tomodol. Propofol has been used safely, but you definitely have to keep an eye on the dose. I mean, if you look at like induction agent, I mean, like something I have to use, I have to swing one hammer. Okay, so you can use propofol, but just be careful with the continuous infusion. Um, but it's, it's a dose abnormality. So what it means for us, good anxiolysis. You don't want those patients get rocked up. Good hydration. Okay. If you see someone in crisis, meaning they have abdominal pain, up, uh, you know, autonomic instability, electrolyte abnormalities, neurological symptoms, if you worry about that, you worry about respiratory function, you worry about aspiration, your cranial nerve function, those patients are at risk for respiratory failure and aspiration. And so you avoid or you eliminate your triggers, you provide hydration, supportive uh, therapy, you give carbohydrates, glucose. Uh, the specific therapy is hematin because it blocks that enzyme um, uh, activity. Somatostatin and plasmapheresis also have been used. <laughs> okay, I am exhausted. Um, I um, apologize for the really fast walk through everything. Um, if you guys have any questions, please uh, feel free to find me. I will send you two files today, that paper, which it's a long paper, but it's well written and really is something of yield uh, for the big picture, not only for the ITE, but also I have a few questions covering the majority of this content just for you guys to review, okay, and see if our speed walk towards the hill was effective. All right, good luck with this, but you guys know that already. Okay, thank you.